Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Aquarium. I'm Jerry Schubel, president of the Aquarium, and it's great to see all of you here this evening, both those of you who are here in person and those of you who are watching remotely. For those of you in the theater, we request that you silence your cell phones and refrain from tweeting for the next hour or so. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge our sponsors, Gazette Newspapers and the Courtyard Marriott to support our lecture series. It's a real pleasure this evening for me to welcome back a friend of nearly 50 years, a distinguished scientist, one of the most distinguished ecologists we've ever had in this country, a distinguished environmentalist, and a distinguished teacher and expositor of science, not only to his students, but to the general public. It's Professor Emeritus Jeremy B.C. Jackson, Professor Emeritus of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Jeremy is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has received more than a dozen prizes and awards, including the Darwin Medal of the International Society for Reef Studies, the BBVA International Prize in Ecology and Conservation, and probably the most prestigious award of all was the one he got from the aquarium a few years back, the Aquarium Ocean Conservation Award. He's a quite an amazing scientist. His work on the collapse of coastal ecosystems was chosen by Discover Magazine as the outstanding scientific achievement of 2001. He was born in Louisville, Kentucky, but he realized that state couldn't contain him. So before he was one, he moved to New York City. He grew up in Miami and in Washington, got his B BS in, in zoology from George Washington University, and a PhD in geology from Yale. So he combines biology and geology. He's been an ecologist, a paleontologist, and many other things. Jeremy and his wife, Nancy, live in New York City and in Brooksville, Maine, where he teaches elementary school children about the environmental issues that we face nationally and in Maine. He's written a remarkable new book with his colleague, Steve Chappell, who is here. And following this lecture, he will be available to sign books. It's quite a remarkable book, and I highly recommend it to you. Please join me in welcoming Jeremy Jackson. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be back here. I, I've spoken here a couple of, of times before, and I, I've always enjoyed it. Um, this book I'm going to talk about grew out of a, a feeling that, um, that the environmental problems that we face in this country um, are not something in the distant future, but very much already with us today. And, and getting um, more and more severe rather quickly. And, and <clears throat> with regard, you know, to the, the issue of climate change, scientists talk about how horrible it's going to be in the year 2100 in terms of sea level rise in temperature or whatever, forgetting the fact that all of us will be dead in 2100. And it's a little hard to relate to things that are that far away in the future. But for those of you who live in California, you know fires are really scary. You know droughts are really bad. And that these things aren't something for 2100. But they're actually very, very much of today. And so this book that Steve and I wrote is an attempt to um, heighten the, the, the severity of the situation that we face, but also to give some idea of how we can cope with it and move forward, because it's still the case that pretty much nothing is hopeless, at least not yet. So um, what I'm going to do, and I'm going to have to, oh, yeah. OK. Yes, it works. OK. So the, the structure of this book is actually a little bit weird. Steve is a journalist. I'm a scientist. Um, and we tend to see the world very differently. And, um, we decided to work things out that what we do is we just travel around the country 
and look at all these situations and issues that we, we um, read about as scientists or journalists and make pronouncements about, but actually talk to the people who live in the areas and, and get our own experience of seeing what's going on. So we made this fantastic series of trips through the farm belt of, of, of the Midwest and also down the Mississippi River to the Delta of Louisiana, which is, is just one of the most extraordinary areas in this country. <clears throat> and then after doing that and meeting people and hearing what they had to say, we, we dug into the science and the consequences of what's going on in terms mostly of farming and sea level rise and extreme weather. And then we look at future prospects. Now there's a whole lot of stuff in this book and, and some of it is, is just very detailed, but I'm just gonna forget about all that and I'm gonna generalize and talk about three categories of problems, the first of which are entirely fixable if we'd um, sort of set our minds to doing it. Then more severe problems which are adaptable to but will have some consequences. And then to confront the things that are truly catastrophic and, and to think about how we as a society are gonna cope with these. And I, I wanna emphasize that although I'm an ecologist, I, I care deeply about nature. I've spent my entire career um, thinking about how ecosystems work and worrying about creatures you never heard of. This is a talk about the human predicament. This is a talk about our lives, our civilization, and the extent to which we are, are vulnerable to very, very rapid changes that are upon us. So the first thing I'm gonna do is talk about agriculture. I sort of can't believe I'm doing that. Um, far, I, I worked as a farmer in Maine for one summer, and I developed a, a very strong respect for being my own boss and not having to do that kind of work, and I ran away from it. Two thirds of all the corn, the soy, the cotton that are grown in this country are what are called Roundup Ready genetically modified organism crops that require bucket loads, swimming pools full of poison, fertilizer, and fossil fuels in order to raise the crops. And the environmental consequences of this agricultural revolution, the green revolution that was going to feed the world, are truly, truly awesome in a very bad way. Um, that's Roundup in the upper left. It's usually sold by the tank load, not by those little bottles that are used by people for their homes, but it's, um, it's a poison. It's a very complex poison. Uh, it's declared by the manufacturers to be safe. It's been called carcinogenic in California, and that's how your food is grown. And the consequence of, the, of this kind of agriculture, which involves sort of laying bare the land has been massive soil erosion. We're losing about this much soil in the heartland of America every year. At the rate we're going, there won't be any topsoil in the heartland of America in not very long from now. There's massive amounts of nutrients that, I, I, I never knew it before I got involved in this, but all fields are what is called tiled. And so, for example, you look at a cornfield like in that previous picture, and what you see is a lot of corn. What you don't see is underneath, there are miles and miles of PVC pipes with holes in them. And, the perp and they're called tiles because the Romans invented this 2,000 years ago and, and actually used clay tiles to do the same thing. And the purpose of this process is to drain the soil so that it's optimally good for, for raising corn. The problem with it, of course, is that all of the nutrients, the fertilizer, the poison, and everything that is put in the cornfields drains into the tiles, and then it goes out into little creeks, which go into streams that go into rivers that go into the Mississippi River, and creates something called the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, which is about the size of everything from Santa Barbara to San Diego. Um, which is an area lacking in oxygen. And that's what that picture in the upper right is, that innocent little hole out of which spews 
all this stuff. Rachel Carson taught us in Silent Spring in 1962 that if you do an evolutionary experiment, if you use DDT and you spray it on fields, evolution is an amazing thing. And there will evolve mosquitoes or flies or whatever that are not only resistant to DDT, but do really well in the presence of DDT. And we should have learned from all that, but no, we didn't. But there are now things called superweeds. And these super, this is an example of a superweed. Uh, it's grown that high in about six weeks. Um, they utterly destroy fields. And they seem to actually like Roundup. In other words, we have repeated the same stupidity we did in the 50s and the 60s with DDT, um, with Roundup, and, and the creation of these pests, which have an enormous impact on fields. I should have put a scale in the lower right-hand picture. That's Lake Erie. That's also about as big as from Santa Barbara to San Diego. And that color-enhanced green is a toxic cyanobacterial bloom. The toxin that comes from that cannot be um, uh, removed by boiling the water. Uh, and the, the litany of problems that can result from cyanotoxins is just extraordinary, including all sorts of neurological dis problems and, and, and vomiting and, and even isolated cases of death. That is the drinking water supply for a huge, for maybe 10 million people in the Midwest. And the, the intakes have to be shut down periodically because the water that the city of, for example, Toledo, Ohio, wanted to pump into the system has become so poisonous that it would have incredibly harmful effects on people. And this problem pervades throughout the aquifers of, of the Corn Belt. And it, it is costing on the order of $1,000 a person a year to make the water pseudo safe to drink because of this agricultural system. So there are a lot of problems. And you would ask yourself, well, what do we get for all these problems? This bargain with the devil, is it really worth it? Well, we get a lot of really good stuff. There, there we go. We get uh, ethanol. Now, the United States is the world's largest exporter of oil. There's a glut of oil, but we subsidize the growing of corn to make ethanol, which is an inferior fuel, which you are required to have in your car, 10%. And it's very good for corn farmers. Uh, we also, from that corn, uh, make high fructose corn syrup. Uh, we grow a lot of hogs, which taste really good, uh, but aren't exactly health food. And we have created a crisis of overweight and obesity in this country, which is the worst in the world. One third of all, two thirds of all Americans are overweight. And one third of all Americans are clinically obese. And the health system time bomb that exists in this and the cost the inherent cost, which is waiting to explode, to deal with all the health problems that have been stimulated by this extraordinarily awful diet, are incomprehensible in terms of cost and downstream consequences. Now, it doesn't all have to be that way here in California. We do a really great job of raising a whole lot of really healthy food, but there are a lot of problems, right? Uh, one of the problems is water. We don't have a lot of water, remember? And yet 90% of all our water goes to raise a lot of crops that we don't need, like um, hay for cattle and all the rest of it. But by and large, we grow really healthy food in California. Those almond groves are really beautiful. And there's probably no place else in America that could grow almonds that well. And they make a lot of money. But we use tons of pesticide. We're really no better than other places in terms of pesticide use. And the other problem that California faces is it's really far away from all the people who want to eat the food of California. So if you have 100 heads of lettuce that come from the Salinas Valley, 2 thirds of those heads of lettuce will spoil 
before they make it to distant markets out of California. In other words, two-thirds of all the food that's being grown in the Salinas Valley, more or less, is going in the garbage can for the one-third that actually gets eaten by me when I go to the store in New York City. The other thing about being far away from markets is think of all the carbon dioxide emissions of the absurdity of taking a truckload of lettuce and driving it 2,500 miles across the country to sell it in New York when, hey, you could, you could grow it in New York. OK, and what's really insane about agriculture is it doesn't have to be that way. All of that biofuel, the ethanol, which is made from fermenting the corn, can be made from natural prairie vegetation. It can from any kind of perennial plants. It produces almost as much biomass, no fertilizer, no water, no soil erosion, no pesticides. It's, it's insane. We don't use it. And the perennial borders that can be used to prevent all that poison from running into the rivers and causing the dead zone um, work really well to reduce the harmful runoff and triple biodiversity. And, and that's what's shown in that figure in the upper right. All the stuff in the top that's big and to the right is good, and all the things that are the problems, the nutrient runoff and, and the rest, soil loss, are, are greatly reduced by having these perennial crops. It's also been shown in endless experiments in fields that you, the taxpayer, paid for that organic agriculture, without any of those problems, can match the production of conventional agriculture. And now there's this revolution happening. The thing on the right, imagine an old abandoned factory in Newark, New Jersey, like a place you might not want to walk down the street at night. And that, what you're looking at, is the inside of that factory. And with sort of minimal use of water and no pesticides and limited nutrient, that factory produces lettuce and other greens to the equivalent of a 130 acre farm. And it tastes really good. And they're on the verge of actually making money. So when we look at the problem of agriculture in America, we look at the poison, the drinking water that you really don't want to drink. I hate bottled water. It's a terrible environmental threat. But when I'm in the Midwest, I drink bottled water because I know it's really not reliably safe. The only thing that is standing in the way of doing things right is three or four mega corporations and the Department of Agriculture who are basically in cahoots to keep this system going because it makes a ton of money for relatively few people. And you should be mad. OK, so let's go on to something which is a little more difficult. This is an aerial photograph of somewhere in the Mississippi Delta. And you ask yourself, well, what's weird about that picture? What are all those straight lines in those photographs? Those straight lines are, are canals that were dug for oil and gas exploration. But the problem with these things is they're like a tumor. And so they grow, and they grow, and the banks of the canals erode, and they get wider and wider and wider and wider until, before you know it, there's not any land. And what you're looking at in that picture is a dying, a dying coastland. Uh, if I forget to say it, I'll say it now. The delta of the Mississippi River is disappearing at the rate of a football field an hour, and it will be gone in 50 to 75 years, completely gone, the entire delta of the Mississippi River. And you can see examples of that in aerial photographs. It's a little hard to see, but it's the only really good picture of it. So up here, you've got about 50, well, now 65 years ago. And all that gray stuff you see, it used this, the river there as a marker. This is all land. OK, and then you get 10, 15 years later, and you, you start to see that it's still mostly land, but there are these sort of water pockets. And then here it is later. And here it is about 10 years ago. All of that is water. 
all of the land that used to be land that's there has disappeared. And now at this point, there's no land whatsoever in that picture. It's all gone because of this erosion. Why is it going away? Well, part of the reason it's going away is because of all that farming up north with all that nitrogen that runs off into the rivers because when it gets to the marshlands of the delta, the, the plants don't need extensive root systems to get nutrient, so they have these little flimsy roots, and then storms come along and just blow it away. Another reason it's disappearing is because of what I said about all those canals. The most egregious example of it is this canal. It was called Mr. Go. It's an acronym for something you don't want to know. And if you know about Hurricane Sandy, and you know about all the people in the Ninth Ward who died, the reason they died is because the Army Corps of Engineers built this canal, and all the water went up in and then broke down the barrier and sort of instantly killed a whole, whole, whole lot of people. In other words, as this book says, we actually made the catastrophe of Sandy. We and our engineers created the thing. Now, Mr. Go was built for shipping, cost a lot of money, in order to avoid the problem of that canal, for a few billion dollars more, we put in this barrier to pseudo fix the problem we created by digging the ditch in the first place. And you should know that the success rate of the Army Corps in protecting New Orleans is zero. And then the picture on the right, what's, what's wrong with that picture on the right? I mean, what are you looking at, the lower right? You're looking at a very famous church. You're looking at the front of the church. Where's the door of the church? Well, the, deer, the door is out of view in the picture because the levee, the levee that is keeping the Mississippi River from flowing into New Orleans is 15 feet above the street. So when you're walking around having fun in the French Quarter or something in New Orleans, you're walking around 15 feet below the mightiest river system in America, just waiting to burst those banks and drown you. That's the reality of New Orleans. And the reason it's that way is because you know you have a river, it floods every once in a while, so you build a little levee. Well, what happens? The bed of the river rises to find its balance. So you build a levee that's a little bit taller, and the bottom of the river comes up in response. And so we've been doing that for 150 years, and we've done a really good job. We've managed to put the bottom of the Mississippi River in New Orleans above the street level of New Orleans. OK, how, high, how fast is sea level going to rise? Um, this aquarium won't be here forever, I'll tell you that. Um, we've been very conservative about sea level rise in the scientific community. The problem is 80 90% of all the water is locked up in Greenland and, and Antarctica. And it's really hard, really hard to model what's going on in those systems. But for the first time, um, NOAA, Jerry and I used to be on the Scientific Advisory Committee of NOAA, and NOAA was really always very conservative, and then they did something really, really brave, and they actually showed the potential extreme scenarios for the first time. And, and, and now, all of a sudden, you know, we're talking about the possibility of a couple of meters, seven feet, of sea level rise by 2100, of course, what we should really be worried about are the details in here, because as I said, not when many of us will be around there, but a whole lot of us will be around here, and it really matters. You can see these lines are diverging very, very fast, because this isn't a linear response. So Zillow, now, you know, we environmentalists, we're really suspect, you know, we're communists and everything, and, and you can't believe anything we say, but Zillow, 
Zillow is the, the organization that wants to sell you homes. They're the real estate business, not exactly known for their extreme left-wing politics. Zillow says that by 2100, 300 cities will lose half of their homes underwater. 30 cities will completely disappear underwater, and one in eight houses in Florida will be underwater. And the cost of that is measured in trillions of dollars. Now, to make this real for you, this is a picture of Greenland from the air. These are rivers of meltwater flowing off of the ice cap on the top of Greenland. A friend of mine, Rob Dunbar, who actually was a wonderful source for this book, has stood in places like that. And he told me, you cannot hear yourself speaking from the roar of the torrents of water that are flowing in these rivers on top of the ice sheet and then disappear into these crevasses down to the bottom. And God only knows where they come out. And of course, we know, for example, that in Antarctica, that the ice is actually moving over the surface of the continent in Antarctica. And we sort of think it's probably doing it in Greenland. Now, look at this number here. Between 1992 and 2001, 10 years, 34 gigatons of ice disappeared. 34 million, million or yeah, billion tons, doesn't matter, disappeared uh, in that decade. But in the next decade, 215 gigatons disappeared. And it's anybody's guess, but the, almost certainly in two years we'll get the next decade's number, and it will, it'll certainly be somewhere in the 800 to 1,000 gigaton number. So in other words, this is an explosive process. It's accelerating very, very, very rapidly. Similar things are happening in Antarctica. And you know, so it, it's a very real threat. And the original numbers based on very conservative science are just clearly too conservative. OK, I grew up, i sort of embarrassed to admit it, but I grew up there uh, for most of my young life in the highest place in Dade County, 13 to 15 feet about sea level, above sea level. The average sea level, uh, height above sea level in Dade County is three feet. Um, when I went to first grade in Miami Beach Elementary School, I lived in a hotel right there. It's called South Beach, and all of that is flooded under this much water every full moon high tide. Miami Beach is spending $20, $25 billion to get 20 more years before they're going to give up on Miami Beach and just abandon it. Um, this is all landfill. All these towers that are being built are built out into Biscayne Bay on landfill that is two or three feet above sea level. When I was young, it was illegal to build a home out here because everybody knew that in bad hurricanes, the waves just broke completely across the island. But a guy named B.B. Rebozo, who was a buddy of a president who had to leave office, said, oh, that's ridiculous, and they developed it all. Now, this is connected to Miami by a very narrow causeway. And we could say that the people who live out there might be the kind of people who think they're stronger in hurricanes until they freak out. So think about the traffic jam of getting all those people off of there onto there, which isn't going to be all that safe anyway. This is a city that wastes to die. Miami will be no more after the next Category 5 hurricane. Don't buy property in South Florida. Um, places like New York are luckier. New York is, is on average a lot higher, 
It's also built in bedrock. One of the big problems that Miami has, that all of Florida has, is it's, it's the rock is honeycomb limestone. If you built a dike on top, the water just goes underneath. It's completely porous. When I lived in that house in the highest place in Dade County, piddling hurricanes, category two hurricanes, would push the water underground in Florida so that the big sinkhole on our property, the water would rise from the pressure. And that was two miles inland. So in other words, there is no solid bedrock in Florida. And that's why you can't build dikes or whatever to protect. Now, New York is really high ro hard rock. You know, the buildings are really, really tall here, right? And they're really tall here, and they're not tall there. That's because there's really hard rock here. And there. So in fact, there's a foundation to do something. Now, Sandy costs $65 billion. And that's way underestimate, because that's just the insured stuff and whatever. The, the number is almost certainly three times that. But let's accept $65 billion. The technology exists. In fact, it already exists in the mouth of the Thames River. The, river, the Dutch are great at it. London is protected by a barrier like this. So two barriers, one here to protect the harbor and another one up there to protect LaGuardia Airport. $25 billion, and New York gets another 50 years. Maybe even 75, who knows? Or you can, that's the Cadillac version. You can do the fiat version and do a lot of little patching up. And that's, you know, that's even cheaper. But it costs $65 billion. And we haven't really built it yet. And isn't that stupid? But at least New York admits there's a problem. You go back here to, yeah, you go back here. The governor of Florida and the mayor of Miami spent the last eight years telling Floridians there was no problem. People should come to Florida and buy new houses in all these places because honest engine, it's really, really OK to come here. And you know, then the people, the people who live here, uh, they pay $3 million for the apartment. They get in their private jet and they leave. But all the people who live, all the area which is out of the picture here, all those people who spent all their life savings to buy their little house, to live there in retirement, they don't have a private airplane. And it's, a, it's going to be a humanitarian crisis. The US Navy has an evacuation plan for the permanent evacuation of South Florida. It exists. OK. And, and, and you know what I just showed, I mean, that affects cities all up and down the East Coast. And I've come to realize here, too. I mean, Long Beach? Really? Mission Bay in San Diego? I mean, these places are not long for the world. OK, this is the really scary stuff, the extreme weather. This is what you've experienced in California. And it's going to get worse. So where I live, I live right there when I don't live there. And in both of those places, there's been this huge increase in the proportion of rain that comes down in freak, strong, destructive rainstorms, where the soil can't absorb all the water, and it runs off, and it causes a lot of erosion. Of course, out here, you'd kill for some of that water, right? And you all know about the droughts. The increase in total precipitation concentrated in extreme storms in the last 20 years. And this is going. But it's not just that, not just stronger storms, flooding, outbreaks of tornadoes. We didn't used to have these outbreaks when there's like 50 or 100 tornadoes that happen in flurries, like a devil's cauldron or something like that. It affected with, and then heat waves. So you, you, I don't know, you might find this hard to relate to. I, my wife and I used to vacation in the middle of nowhere in the south center of France. And we were there in the summer of 2003, the famous chaleur, the famous heat wave of 2003. 35,000 people died in the heat wave in Western Europe in 2003. 
mostly old people and young people. It is projected not by a bunch of you know, radical organizations, but by US government health, that the number of heat deaths that will occur in the United States will match the number of people killed in all automobile accidents. And, and you know, and, and, and this is happening. Heat waves are happening more and more, and they have these consequences. Like me, why is it bright white? It's because there's no water there. Lowest level since the dam was built. And you know, you do not want to live in Arizona because California, by a certain corrupt manipulation of the treaty, has first dibs on all the water after Colorado. Arizona gets sloppy 17th or something. So I mean, and this is gonna this is gonna be quite an issue, right? Because there's no water. Forget Las Vegas. I mean. All of its water comes from this, and it's disappearing. Major US cities in extreme drought, LA, Houston, Phoenix, San Antonio, Las Vegas, Dallas, Fort Worth. The groundwater here is 85% depleted. We had those heavy rains, but the groundwater, the deep groundwater, is still 85, is still so depleted that there's this huge increase in the probability of drought. And then I love this picture. Uh, you may not all be into environmental journalism, but let me tell you, The Guardian, which is a newspaper published in England, has the best environmental journalism of any paper. Plight of Phoenix, how long can the world's least sustainable city survive? Phoenix is an oxymoron. It is a desert with maybe two years of groundwater, dependent on that Colorado River, and you saw how healthy the fresh water supply is there. And they still have fountains in Phoenix. It's not illegal to have a lawn in Phoenix. At least in New Mexico, they banned lawns in Albuquerque. But you know, uh, I, it's, it's just incomprehensible to someone like me. Anyway, hurricanes are increasing in the Atlantic. That's pretty clear. And uh, they're getting strong and they're getting bad. Steve and I had to almost completely rewrite the last half of our book during the summer of 2017. The previous record for the number of Category 5 hurricanes to hit the United States in a single year was one. In five weeks, we had three, right? We had Harvey, which trashed Houston. And we had Irma, and we had Maria. And in spite of the um, disinformation from the government, we are now virtually certain that at least 3,000 and maybe closer to 4,000 Puerto Ricans died in Hurricane Maria. Um, the firestorms of California, they are due to climate change. They are due to drought. They are due to the changed climate in California because of all this. And the, the costs are measured in the trillions. I, I don't know. I wasn't here when those fires happened. But that, to me, looks like a Renaissance artist's depiction of hell. And that was 20. And we, you had a really big fire here recently, too, which was just that bad. People are talking about the new normal as if 2017 was the new normal, but that's not true. The new normal is it will get worse and worse and worse every year. Hot water, you know, this really, this, you know, I'm a scientist. This makes me really mad. It's high school physics and chemistry that the hotter the water, the stronger a storm will be. Duh, right? Because a hurricane is a heat engine. And the water in the ocean has to be a certain temperature in order for the situation to be set up to create a tropical storm. Oh, no, 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 no. You know, warming isn't having any effect. 
But think about it. It's a prediction. It's a scientific prediction. If a hurricane is moving along and it runs into a lot of hot water, it will instantly get stronger. Well, Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey was this dippy little storm down, down here. It came up. It got to about here. It went from a tropical depression to a category four in 30 hours. Went up here, walked across Houston a couple of times, dropped you know, a yard of water or more on Houston. And then the same thing happened again. But of course, the scientists, they don't know what they're talking about. Same thing happened. A little piddling storm starts somewhere down you know, south of Jamaica, and it sort of wanders north. And then it hits hot water. Goes from a, you know, a tropical storm to a category, a category one, and then a category four in less than a day. And then it sweeps across the Florida panhandle, leveling it, right? Leveling it. Um, what would have happened if that storm went across there? That happened in 1926 or 8, I always forget. The waves made it to the, where the airport is. Miami Beach had ocean breaking across it. There were less than 200,000 people there, and over 1,000 died. You project it up to the 6 million people who live in the area now, and you can see why the Navy has an evacuation plan. But you have to understand it's to never go back because the groundwater of Florida will be completely contaminated, contaminated by salt water, and there won't be anything to drink. OK. So what are the prospects of all this grim and horrible stuff? Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot, I mean, aside from the fact that we can fix the agriculture problem tomorrow, and aside from the fact that we could just get smart and start moving our cities a little bit to accommodate Sea ball rise. Um, there is a lot of good news and a lot of bad news. Um, wind and solar power, are, you should know, are not subsidized in this country. But oil and gas, the poor oil companies, there's, they're, they're in so much trouble, we subsidize their industry. Did you know ExxonMobil is subsidized by the United States government? Your tax dollars are subsidizing? ExxonMobil. But the unsubsidized wind and solar are cheaper than subsidized fossil fuels, and we're switching over really fast. Denmark, Germany, Italy, they're already 25 to 40 percent wind power. Norway has more than half of its cars 100 percent electric. I just bought a Chevrolet Bolt. It goes 240 miles on a single charge. I charge it overnight in my garage. I mean, other countries. Norway says they won't have anything but electric cars in five, seven years. But, OK, and then the very large batteries, which are essential for times when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow. Probably the greatest contribution of Elon Musk is not the Tesla, but the batteries that are really going to make this work. Um, producing electricity, what a concept. You know, we have this national grid for defense. And so we transmit electricity for 1,000 miles. Well, guess what? The resistance in those wires, we lose half or more than half of all the electricity we made by transporting it from one place to another. If you, you make it where you use it, it's, it's amazing. You don't lose all that. There have been huge advances in energy efficiency in buildings and transportation. It really is true that all cars to light trucks could be electric in, in 10 years. Norway's proving that. The only thing that's holding us back, just like agriculture, is the oil companies want to get the last buck. You should be mad about that. I'm 76. I'm just going to go off and drink. All you guys who are young, you've got a problem. You should be worried about it. Vote. OK, so California, you know, I don't know how many of you are Californians, but you should be pretty proud to be Californian. 
Uh, San Diego, uh, I couldn't believe it, but San Diego committed itself to be 100% clean energy by 2035. And they're doing it by a whole diversity of ways that I'm not going to bore you with, but they're actually doing it. State of California is investing billions in all this, and you're going to be legally required by 2045. That was Jerry Brown's parting gift to you all. By 2045, all of your electricity will be green energy, all of it. And this energy company in the Midwest, it's, it's, it's making half of its electricity is building up to do that from renewables very quickly. OK, I'm done. There's all this good stuff happening, but there's also bad news. New York Times yesterday, I don't know how, you should all at least spend five or 10 minutes looking at the only one of two decent newspapers in America to know what they're saying, and know that there was a 3.8% increase in United States emissions last year. How come? How come? What did that have to do with it? Why did that happen? OK, so let's say we get around that. Let's say we solve certain impediments in the political process. But there are still really big challenges. How fast can we overcome the social problems, the resistance, and the technological challenges to fully convert to renewables? It's a speed problem. It's a rate problem. How much more extreme weather, stronger, stronger storms, worse and worse firestorms, how much more sea level rise is already locked into the system that we're going to have to deal with no matter what we do? And then something you may not have thought about, are we going to be able to modulate, to tamp down global conflict mass migration, and warfare. The wars in the Middle East are water and food wars. All of North Africa is starving. The migration wave into Europe is driven by that starvation and that poverty. The, the problems in the Middle East are, you think of them as oil, you think of us messing around in their lives, but there's this huge fundamental problem of water and availability. And most of the wars in the world today that are going on are environmentally induced wars. And then finally, what the, the prize that should exist above all prizes is the person who figures out how to put the genie back in the bottle. How do we figure out how to take the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and put it somewhere safe? Um, we understand how to do it in principle, it's easy, but to do it on the scale of the massive CO2 loop, we don't know how to do that. Okay, that's it. That's a picture of Steve, my co-author. We had a ball. He's standing at the headwaters of the Mississippi River, where it's this wide, and you can walk across from stone to stone. Thanks a lot. Turn on the light. I hate it when you can't see anybody. All right, we have time for a few questions. If you have a question, raise your hand, and we'll bring a microphone to you. Who's got the first one? Always quiet. All right, we got one right here. It seems to me that the most significant impediment to, if not turning around our climate problem, at least mitigating it, is political will or lack thereof, rather than knowing how to do it. Am I right? Yes. I mean, there are issues. If you get into the weeds of the climate science, um, it is true that we've already created a problem of sufficient scale that we're going to have to figure out how to diminish that. And that's a science question we don't know how to do yet. But basically, you're right. I mean, we, we have the electric cars. I mean, my car goes 240 miles. It's true it would be hard to drive to New York from here in that car. Although, actually, I have an app that shows me all the places where I can do it. And it's practical. It works. But um, I, I think there's 
even among well-meaning people, I mean, look at the way Southern California just voted. Southern California just voted very progressive. In San Diego, in Orange County, this amazing switch, LA. We just drove up here. I saw one house with a solar panel on it, on the roof. I mean, it's shocking. And so, and yet this is an area that supports politicians who do this. So I think we're all complicit. And I think it's not just a problem of, let's say, the current administration in Washington and its policy. I think it's also the fact that we have not assimilated the fact that the way we live is unsustainable. What's tragic about it is we don't have to give up anything. My new electric car is dynamite. And if I could have afforded a Tesla, it'd be really dynamite, right? So, so all of these things are there for us to do, but we have to change our mindset. So I don't think it's just a matter of the evil industry. I think there's a, a big social change that's going to need to happen. And one of the reasons I have so much respect for the last administration of California is that he understood that. Jerry Brown understood that. And so he thought pretty deeply about sort of the, the social movement of it all, which is something that we should, should hope will happen more. But, but the basic point, we can fix it. We know how to fix it. We're just not doing it. And we're not doing it because we're corrupt. Go ahead, in the back, was it Francis? Your lecture was absolutely phenomenal. Um, I had three short matters. Okay, regarding the fires, could that be a good part of the reason why the three point some levels higher? From I, all first of all, I can't see who it was. Oh, over here. Where? Here. Okay. Okay, regarding the fires in California, and they're getting worse and worse. If something isn't done about that, what you were talking about, the three-point-something increase this, in the emissions of the gases, and then you spoke about Roundup, and I had something to ask about that and something about Okay, the so the fires in California, I'm not going to pretend that I understand everything about the fires in California. The ground is really dry. I mean, right. dry at the level of the collapse of... Palo Verde, all those great civilizations in Arizona and New Mexico that sort of snuffed out almost a thousand years ago. So the ground is super dry. There's not a lot of water. The water that comes comes in these torrential storms like you had a year and a half ago, runs out the LA River because the LA just, you know, built the most moronic system in the world for its water, which can be fixed. It could easily be fixed for 10. $15 billion, but it could be fixed. But, the, but the, you just have a very bad climatic situation in Southern California for fires. That's always been true. What's happened from climate change and this extreme drought is it's made that worse. And, um, and then you have the thing, and this is something I don't know a lot about, but it's very clear <clears throat> that the big fires make their own environment. And when I talk about firestorms and this sort of taking off and away, and that's, that's a posit, what we call a positive feedback. And, and so the net result of is that when it's a runaway process like that, it makes it worse and worse. Now, it's not going to get wetter, and it's certainly going to stay dry and it's going to get hotter. And so that means that fires are going to be more likely to happen. And you'll have these rains like ne right now that are making the fuel for the fires for a year from now. So if I lived in California again, I'll tell you one thing. I would not live in Chaparral. I wouldn't live anywhere near Bush. And I remember when I lived in San Diego, when the firemen in San Diego said, you build your house in those woods, you're on your own because we're not going to risk our lives to go in there and save you from building your house in a really stupid place. But what percentage 
of Southern Californians built their houses in really stupid places. And, and, and we're just gonna have to stop doing that. And that's a way of adapting, recognizing the reality that the fire risk is always gonna be there. It's, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And just why would you wanna raise a family in a place where you all might get burned? So the implications of that are sort of like the first question. It's, it's we know how to respond. We could zone housing in Southern California in terms of fire risk. A lot of people would be very unhappy. I wouldn't want to venture a guess uh, what proportion of homes would have to be abandoned if we actually insisted on the houses being in places relatively safe from fire. And I had a question about Roundup because they're using it around in the Long Beach area and other places. What suggestions do you have as we as individuals can help make a difference regarding the catastrophic effect that's having on our food and on the environment? Well, you know, I don't, want, I don't wanna, I think the biggest problem with Roundup is the kind of stuff I talked about, the, <clears throat> the damage to the farmland. They're all indirect effects. I personally believe Roundup is, it has harmful effects on people. But I think those direct effects are a lot less than the indirect effects, effects of the poison drinking water and the loss of soil and all the rest of it. There's something scarier than Roundup. It's called Dicamba. And um, the same companies, Monsanto and whatever, are pushing the use of this stuff. If it blows away from the field where it was sprayed to another field, it has catastrophic effects on the neighboring farm. One farmer in Oklahoma, I think it was, killed his neighbor because he used dicamba and it wiped out his field. So it's our first chemical warfare murder in American agriculture. But um, you know the chemical industry is desperate and they're promoting this stuff and they can see the weight of opinion moving, but they're very powerful. The agricultural situation is the most shocking. Because in terms of the first question, it is easily 100% fixable. And my other thing Fra Francis, let, let, let somebody oh, else have Let somebody else have one, okay? You've had, had two, and this gentleman here with the dashing white hair. <laughs> hey, great talk. Uh, coral, is there, are there easy fixes for coral? When's the last time? Oh, God, you're talking about my love. I said I'd... I'd only talk about people, right? Yeah. But when because actually what I've learned is that, although it's hard for me to admit, most people don't give a damn about corals or fishes or whatever. So if you really want to grab them by the juggler vein, you tell them about how they're screwed rather than the corals, and they pay more attention. Um, corals are a really bad situation. Um, they're particularly vulnerable to increases in temperature. They're also vulnerable to the acidification of the ocean, although I personally believe that's an overhyped issue. Um, very much so, actually. Um, but the, the temperature thing is real. Corals are migrating to more the, towards the poles. And um, kelp, by the way, are also migrating. They need, you know, the, they're the what they need colder water, and so. Like around the coast of Australia, all the kelp on the southwest coast of Australia is pretty much gone, and it's now only on the southern coast, and corals are moving down along that southwest coast. And that looks good. Um, corals as animal, coral animals, are not going to go extinct. Coral reefs as we know them, these vast, beautiful structures, they're going. And... Um, so there's a lot of work, Jerry and I were talking about this earlier, to um, breed super corals by um, genetic manipulation. And there's a lot of really hopeful stuff happening with that. And so I, I think that will be at least partially successful. But if you want to see a really beautiful coral reef and dive on it, do it now. I don't dive anymore. Because for me, to go diving is so depressing. And then what's even more depressing 
is that I have to get in the water for some reason. And I come out of the water, and I'm crying. And somebody 30 years old or 20 years old says, it was so beautiful. And that's the shifting baselines problem, that everybody thinks natural is the way it was when they were 15. And unnatural is all the stuff that happens afterwards, which is why I'm a lot more more depressing than they are. But then, you know, they don't listen to their parents either. And so they think natural is the way it is when they're 15, and they make the same mistake. And so it, it really, I, you know, I get angry, and then I have to realize, well, that's all they've ever seen. And to them, it's beautiful, because instead of having these big, beautiful coral reefs, I mean, I remember the north coast of Jamaica when it was 70, 75 percent live coral. I remember the water was so clear that we'd go night diving to 120 or 150 feet, turn off the lights, and swim around looking at all the animals that come out at night. It was extraordinary. Now, you go to the same reef. There's about 10 or 15 percent live coral cover. There's a lot of seaweed. There's a lot of death. And you can't see 50 feet because all of that eutrophication has made the water cloudy. And in Florida, when I was a kid, they used to advertise the beautiful crystal clear blue waters. Then around the 70s or 80s, they started advertising the beautiful emerald green waters. Well, that emerald green is pollution. We'll take one, one in the back. Uh, so it should be, is it? Yes. I'm um, going back to the human dimension. I saw that there was Phoenix, Dallas, Houston, Los Angeles, which are four of the 10 largest cities in the United States. And he also said New Orleans and Miami are at a pretty large risk for mass evacuation. So what do you think your prediction is for how those populations are going to be absorbed? Are they going to go further oh, inland? Thank you. Do you think those cities will have an Thank you. You know, I land? actually... Like Riverside couldn't sustain Los Angeles, I don't think. Thank you for that question. This, this is what the spooks have nightmares about at night. This is what the the security people. Really, I had the privilege of participating at some meetings at the Naval War College. And, and let's say the big one hits Miami. There will be a minimum of six million climate refugees in the richest country in the world. Does Georgia want those people? No. First of all, they're going to be, most of them are going to be broke. They will have lost everything they have. It will people, be people who are not accustomed to suffering. These are not street people. These are mostly white people who are used to a certain standard of living and a sense of who they are. And all of a sudden, they're refugees. And um, you know, one of the things that people don't know about um, Hurricane Katrina is that in spite of the utter ineptitude of the federal government, the evacuation of New Orleans, with the exception of the people stuck in the Ninth Ward, was arguably the most successful, well-managed evacuation of a huge number of people in modern history. It was a stellar performance. And, um, and those people have become assimilated. And I will add that um, the very diverse population of, of New Orleans has exhibited a level of basic intelligence which probably exceeds that of other regions because more than half of them didn't come back because they knew. But um, this question, I mean, it won't happen to all the places at the same time, but it's going to happen somewhere. And then we're going to have to figure out what to do with them. And are we going to be kind? Are we going to care? Uh, it was demonstrably the case that we didn't think Puerto Ricans were people. So we just w let them wallow in their hell. Uh, but we thought the people of Houston were people, so we, we really got to it and we worried about them. But you know, huge numbers of people in Houston are still screwed. And in that case, you should know that the Army Corps was trying to do something good. They said, do not allow development in this whole area 
of Houston because it's sinking and it's just going to be, people will die if they live there. So the governor of Texas of the time and the mayor of Houston made sure that the Army Corps was pulled off of the job of worrying about the community planning in Houston. So they created the problem. Um, Houston sits on a ton of water, but they can't pump it because it would just sink below the ocean. So they, they, they're screwed. So eventually, they're going to have to go somewhere. So they're, they're all going to move. Relatively speaking, California is really lucky. California has a lot of high ground, got a lot of wealth, a lot of space. We can make water. And we, we, we could make all our electricity from wind and solar if we wanted to. But the, this, this issue, and this goes back to the first question. To really solve these questions, you have to accept that all of us, every American citizen, is responsible for the well-being of the victims of the first climate disaster. If we don't take care of them, if we don't show compassion for them, we as a society will utterly collapse. Jeremy, on that uh, cheerful note, you've given, a, you've given us a lot to think about. And Jeremy will be available if you want to buy a copy of his book. I think. Uh, oh, buy books, buy books. Uh, he'll, and so if you buy one book, he'll answer one question. Buy two books, two questions. And we'll do this until you. I got to get home tonight. You either run out of money or we run out of books. Jeremy, thank you very much. You're very welcome. Very welcome.